So I'm excited here to welcome this amazing historian. I would like to call him a psychedelic archaeologist. Oh, and a psychedelic historian. So without further ado, Tom Hatsis, everyone, give it up. Hi, thank you all for being here. So in the uh, program or on the website, it says that I'm going to be giving the same talk three times throughout the weekend. That is not true. I will be giving three different talks because uh, I didn't want to do you guys like that because that struck me as a little lazy. So we're going to be going through the history of psychedelic use um, from the ancient world to the present day. Today, I'm going to focus on psychedelic use in the ancient world, specifically uh, dealing with uh, mystery ceremonies and magic and witchcraft. Tomorrow, uh, for the people that raise their hands like, oh, I'm witchy, tomorrow's talk is on uh, medieval witches' ointments. I actually wrote the, the definitive volume on that, and we're going to talk about the lost religion of the goddess, what these women were actually doing, and how the church demonized all of that. And then on Sunday, I'm going to be getting into my really weird witchy practices to cover the modern day. Cool? Yeah. All right, rock it. <laughs> also, this is interesting. Um, I host, uh, I don't know, Morgan, did you notice this? Do you see what's sitting right there? The carpet. That is the open mic carpet. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm home right now because we use that very carpet that you're sitting on. That's our stage every week for the past, has it been three years now? Three and a half years, something like that, we've been running that mic. So that was really cool to see. So I need to start off uh, saying a few things. Uh, one, I am not sick at all. I just happen to be Italian from New York. This is what my voice sounds like. I apologize, I cannot do anything about it. So, I am feeling healthy. Sometimes people ask if I'm not well. <laughs> because of that. <laughs> Second, I, because I'm an Italian from New York, um, every now and then I do, now nah, skip over that. I'll do my best to use words that are family friendly. I'll leave it there. Number three, I tend to use the word psychedelic in a way that um, some of my critics have been most happy to tell me really pisses them off. <laughs> Very happy to let me know that. Some people use the word psychedelic and when they do, they're talking about a specific kind of drug action on the brain. Or they'll talk about something that has an indole ring in common. They'll say that's what psychedelic is. For me, psychedelic has more to do with a kind of experience from the original word, psychedelic, coming from two Greek words, suka and delin, meaning mind manifesting. So I use the term to mean mind manifesting. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Anyone familiar with the writer Fitzhugh Ludlow? No? Okay. Well, he was a pretty well-known writer in the 1800s, and he wrote this quick passage about mescaline that I'd like to share with you. He wrote, quote, just real quick, does everybody agree that mescaline is a psychedelic? Yeah? Okay. He wrote, Though far from believing that my own ecstasy through mescaline use has claimed to such inspiration as an apostle's, the states are nonetheless analogous in this respect. They both share the nature of disembodiment, and the soul, in both, beholds realities of greater or lesser significance, such as may never be apprehended again out of the light of eternity." Close quote. Now, those people who consider mescaline a psychedelic, who here considers cannabis a psychedelic? Anybody? Some people? Okay, cool. Some people don't. My point here in all of this is to say that that quote I just read you, he actually wasn't talking about mescaline, he was talking about cannabis. And yet the only thing I had to do was take out the word cannabis and put the word mescaline in instead, and you couldn't tell the difference, because we're talking about a similar experience. Or what about a guy named Gilolimus Badolphus, who was stationed in Aleppo, Syria in the early 1600s? And speaking about uh, eating magic mushrooms or psilocybe mushrooms, he said, 
They eat mushrooms, which make them forget themselves as though they saw visions and heard revelations. Because we all know mushrooms can cause us to see visions and hear revelations. Except Adolphus actually wasn't talking about mushrooms, he was talking about opium. And yet all I had to do was just take one medicine out and put another one in, and the psychedelic sentiment remains the same. So I just wanted to give that warning because throughout this weekend I'm going to be using psychedelic to refer to things like cannabis, opium, mandrake, henbane, where the witch is at again, mandrake and henbane, anybody? Okay, yes, cool, perfect. Which again does bother some people. I point out these examples from history to at least say that there is some historical precedent for how I'll be using these words. Now, I could actually literally spend the entire hour giving quote after quote that demonstrates this point, but I don't want to uh, bore you that much, more than I already have. Let's see, where to begin the talk then? Okay, so those four that I just discussed, uh, cannabis, opium, mandrake, and henbane, are what I call the big four of the ancient world. When you read ancient texts, as I am wont to do, you'll find that those are the things that come up the most often. However, there is also this other category in the ancient world of stuff that we know had psychedelic or psychoactive or psychotropic or whatever you want to call it effects, yet we don't know what these things were. So it's just a few examples. Hurry and look. Anyone ever heard of hurry and look? Me neither. Apparently it got you pretty fucked up though in the ancient world. <laughs> Hippomanes, anyone ever use hippomanes? No? Same thing, gelatophilus, theangelus, and thalassigal. These are all things written about in the ancient world that we are told had psycho psychedelic effects, but we don't know what they are today. They could be known things, like one of these things could be cannabis, and this is just some kind of local name for it, and, and that did happen. In fact, uh, in parts of Greece, worshippers of the goddess Hera would offer up burning uh, incense of cannabis, to Hera. Now, the Greek travel writer Posianus tells us in his, uh, his book, uh, Geography of Greece, oh, these Hera worshippers, they offer up Asterion. But he never tells us what Asterion is, and in fact, we only know today what Asterion was in the ancient world, because a medical writer named Galen told us, oh, the Greeks call cannabis Asterion. By the way, uh, the word Asterion means little star, because they thought that the, uh, the uh, leaves on the plant look like little stars. So that's where Asterion comes from. Um, on other things, like the Persian Magi, the guys that went to visit Jesus and give him the presents and all that, we've all we've heard that story, yes? No? No Bible believers out here? <laughs> that's so weird. <laughs> anyway, um, Pliny the Elder tells us that um, those Persian magi actually like to alter their consciousness with this uh, plant called gelatophilus that I mentioned earlier. Again, we don't know what that was, but we know that magi would use it to enter a prophetic state. It could have been cannabis, it could have been a mushroom, we don't know what it was. I crossed so much out of this talk, I gotta find... <laughs> Here we go, so for now we're gonna begin in... Uh, oh. I should say this also. I almost forgot. I want to focus on how these pharmaca were actually used in the ancient world, specifically for mystery ceremonies and magic. Now the thing is, people didn't call these substances psychedelic or entheogenic in the ancient world because those terms hadn't been coined yet. So in my book, uh, Psychedelic Mystery Traditions, I had to come up with some new terms to describe what these people were using. So these are some neologisms that'll help us throughout this talk and my talks throughout the weekend. The first is mystheogen. Mystheogen is using any kind of plant medicine or fungal medicine to uh, generate an epiphany in a mystery ceremony setting. And pytheogen means to use psychedelics in magic. So mystheogen and pytheogen. Uh, we're going to start in prehistory and work our way up to the dawn of civilization. And then we're going to explore the various medical mysteries and other secret ceremonies of early pagan civilizations and how they evolved into larger festivals, much like this one, that would soon include thousands of people. 
we will also see how these kinds of psychedelics that were once exclusively used by priestesses in temples ended up leaving the temples, being brought out to the street, and used in magic and witchcraft. Now, our journey is going to begin in prehistory, where unfortunately, nobody knows really much of anything that actually took place. So, <laughs> we're kind of all shooting in the dark here. So as such, we don't actually know why the first psychoactive plants were consumed, or why they were consumed. Uh, they could have been used experimentally, they could have been used on slaves, yes that did happen. They could have used them on prisoners of war, or uh, people that had been imprisoned. Three cheers for people being imprisoned and using psychedelics, nice. Now I know that's an applause line for later on. I'll, I'll have to remember that one. Now, it's also been hypothesized that some people might have simply been looking for plants to make a builder fi to build a larger fire because they were cold at night and they might have accidentally used cannabis or opium, threw it on this fire, and that kind of started the party. Now, yeah, party. <laughs> well, at least they love me over there, right? <laughs> you know, this idea, though, that people were throwing up uh, plants like cannabis on fires to keep warm actually has linguistic precedent. One of the oldest words we have for cannabis is the Assyrian kunabu. Kunabu, when you could hear where can- oh, Richard, oh. You can actually hear where um, cannabis comes from kunabu, they are uh, etymologically related. Kunabu is a, an Assyrian verb meaning to produce smoke. So somebody in ancient Assyria was burning this stuff and was like, hey, let's make a word out of that. Probably after, you know, eating a lot. Now, because uh, there is no uh, uh, projector and screen, I did print out some handouts that, if you guys would be kind enough to pass around to help out, we're taking it all the way back, we're going archaic now, with, ah! <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we can only speculate, of course, but by the dawn of the earliest civilizations, people were well familiar with cannabis, opium, and hosts of other psychoactives that found their way into mystery rituals. Now, one of the first and one of the oldest is, has to do with uh, the great mother, Inanna, from Uruk and then Sumer. Anyone familiar with Inanna, the goddess? Fuck yeah, I love it. Awesome. Okay. Here we begin to see one of the oldest mystery ceremonies humanity has to offer. This is the sacred marriage of the Divine Feminine and the Divine Masculine in the form of the Uruk Vase. Uh, that is the Uruk Vase and the, on the other side is the bottom panel which shows um, grains of opium and uh, grain and opium growing. Now the vase works in three sections, that one is the bottom. Uh, the second section shows servants preparing the opium. Now the reason I put the two together is that uh, these Greek amphorae were used to show what was actually in a wine jug. That's why it's in the shape of opium. Uh, if you see that there, sir, uh, the wine jug is in the shape of an opium capsule. That was done so that people would know what was inside. Now, as it turns out, um, archaeochemists have scraped the insides of these jugs, and they did test positive for opium residue. So we have archaeochemical evidence that people were mixing opium in their wines, especially with uh, mystery ceremonies like the sacred marriage of Inanna and Dumuzi. Now, the whole thing about dying and rising goddesses uh, and gods in the ancient world, although the first one was a goddess, Inanna, kind of the rub of the whole thing was that if you got to cheat death, you had to send somebody to replace you. That's who Dumuzi was. So what some people, and I count myself among them, believe is going on with this Uruk vase is that Inanna rises from the dead in the form of grain and opium. It's prepared. They have the sacred ceremony and then, as Inanna is lifted higher into the heavens, Dumuzi dis uh, disappears into the underworld. 
Too much time has unfortunately passed, so we don't know the specifics of this ritual, but that is the conclusion that some have drawn. My, I count myself among them. Sorry, just a few more. Question? Yeah, of course, please. Uh, is opium really considered theogenic or other than, you know, colleges, pain, and... Is the question, uh, do people consider opium entheogenic? Yeah, again, so throughout history, and I document this in my books, and I kind of mentioned it at the beginning of this talk, you'll have people talking about opium in ways where if you take the opium out and put LSD there, it's like, this sounds like an LSD experience. They're very different. Yeah, oh, uh, absolutely very different. But um, you have to take these things at the time and place within the culture uh, surrounding it. You know, it's, it's easy for us to throw our modern ideas onto the past and say, well, this isn't psychedelic or that's not psychedelic. I try to respect the culture that I'm looking into. And if they present something in terms that to me sounds psychedelic, then I go with what they feel about it. And again, this is, a, like I said also, a lot of people do not like that I do that. So, you know, you're in very good company. <laughs> There's a lot of people that hate it. <laughs> Question, not a, not a concern about you. Oh, sure, and feel free to ask any questions along the way. I don't mind at all, please. So anyway, we also see evidence of uh, this goddess with opium in Italy. And there's a small Neolithic uh, city dating to around 6,000 before the Common Era called La Marmota, which is about 20 miles north of Rome. The, car, uh, the, the city, excuse me, sits at the bottom of Lake Bracciano and uh, is known as La Marmota, which translates to the Marmot. Diver excavators uncovered a room that not only had a whole lot of opium products, but also had... Now I see like, people, why people like PowerPoint so much. These, thank you so much. Many of you will recognize these as goddess figurines. Uh, they were found in the same room that had these opium products. So again, it is assumed by um, archaeologists and historians that this might have been some kind of psychomedicinal room where you'd go in, take opium to enter an altered state of consciousness or the dream realm, and I'm going to get big into that tomorrow in my talk, to meet the goddess. And she would t tell you how to heal yourself. Now, as this idea moved its way west, um, it turned into, sorry. These are the clearest examples we have of this. What I'm now passing out is known as the Minoan Opium Goddess. These are little statuettes that were found that show a goddess figurine wearing a crown of opium. So this was a very widespread belief in the ancient world. Um, this was also used in Egypt with uh, worship of the goddess Isis. People would go to the temples of Isis, take opium, fall into this deep but lucid dream state from the opium, meet the goddess, and she would heal them or tell them how to heal themselves. We also see other psychoactives. I don't want to just say fixated on opium, but has anyone here ever worked with mandrake before? Mandrake? No? I, I've worked with mandrake. It can be cu quite harrowing, but in the ancient world, it was actually all the rage. People loved mandrake back in the day. And we see mandrakes appearing in the myths and legends about the Egyptian goddess Hathor. If anyone's familiar with Hathor, the goddess... Yes! You've been raising your hand a lot. I like you. <laughs> so one of the earliest Egyptian myths about Hathor has that goddess slaughtering all of humankind under the orders of the sun god Ra. Apparently humans were making fun of Ra and he didn't like it. He was like, all right, Hathor, go kill those uh, people. I was about to drop a bomb, but I stopped because it's children. So Ra told Hathor to slaughter everybody. Now, as Ra watched Hathor kill everybody, he had a change of heart. So in short, the sun god saw the light and he decided, you know what? I don't think uh, we should be killing all these people, but there was no way to stop Hathor's bloodthirsty wrath. In fact, it was so, she was so bloodthirsty, she was literally drinking the human blood out of the streets. So Ra had an idea. He said, okay, 
He sent two of his servants to an island called Elephantine, which is on the Nile River. And he ordered them to make huge batches of mandrake-laced beer. Mandrake is a very, again, very powerful psychoactive. Um, I've used it in my practices. I'll be talking about that on Sunday. So they mix this beer and they throw this mandrake beer into the blood-filled streets so that when Hathor woke up, she would drink it again. And it sort of mellowed her harsh. And so every year at the Feast of Hathor, uh, Egyptians would celebrate by drinking the same psychedelic beer that had saved humanity. So they would all drink this sacred mandrake beer. Now this ritual is very different from the one I mentioned about Inanna because here we actually know how the psychoactive fits into the myth. Whereas with Inanna, we can only speculate. And I'd like to just move forward and address a deeper mystery here, one I kind of touched upon earlier, but I want to unpack it a little more. And that is the sacred marriage of the divine feminine and divine masculine in the ancient world. The sacred marriage might have first been conceived of when the sky god impregnated Mother Earth with rain, although we don't know how it initially formed. That's one hypothesis. But at some point, it did creep into... Any hey, what's up, brother? How you doing? How you been? No, it's all good. This is Don Juan the Devastator. Uh, we played roller derby together for a few years. This guy is one badass fucking skater. I mean, he's one amazingly good skater. Anyway, well, let me... I'll see you around. I'll see you around. Smoke a joint later. I'll let you do it. Anyway, so for example, the sacred marriage. Uh, we need only look to the ancient priestess of Delphi, the Pythia, right? Uh, these pi priestesses would sit on a tripod in the temple of Apollo over a crack in the earth that would expel these psychoactive fumes. So the fumes would come up, the priestess would be overtaken by them, and she would give her prophecy. Now, this is not mystheogenic or pythogenic. I think it's properly entheogenic, meaning to generate divinity from within. I'm sure a lot of you know that. Because here you literally have the god Apollo going inside the priestess herself, inside the oracle, to generate visions. That is uh, another example of what the sacred marriage would look like, the union of the masculine energies and the feminine energies in the ancient world. Now, the term entheogen itself is actually based on an ancient Greek word, enthusiasmos, which we, I'm sure you've all guessed, we get our modern word, enthusiasm, which translates to intoxicated revelry. Well, that's what enthusiasmos <laughs> meant. Now, the god of this liberated mental state was Dionysus. The liberator of choice was alcohol. Although, there can be no doubt that sometimes the psychoactive was mixed into these Dionysian alcohols. In fact, we know the name of a Dionysian alcohol mixed with a psychoactive. It was called a trimma, T-R-I-M-M-A in the ancient world. Now, the Maenads, who are the, they're called followers of Dionysus. I tend to think of them as priestesses of Dionysus. They would get high off of something called ivy. Now, we don't know of any kind of psychoactive ivy in the modern world, or if you do, please tell me, because I could possibly have an entire garden of psychoactives in my backyard that I don't even know about. But uh, Plutarch tells us that this kind of ivy was actually psychoactive. So earlier I talked about the psychoactives we know about in the ancient world. Then there's another group of things like we don't know what they were, like hurry and luck and gelatophilus and things like that. There's still a third category of things that were seen to be psychoactive in the ancient world that we don't see as psychoactive today. One of those things was ivy. But you tell me, this is how Plutarch, the great Plutarch, describes ivy. He says there's a certain kind of it that possesses an exciting and distracting breath of madness, deranges persons and agitates them, and brings on a wineless drunkenness and joyousness in those that are precariously disposed towards spiritual exaltation. Again, these are, that to me sounds like some kind of psychoactive, right? A wineless drunkenness, a plant that brings on a wineless drunkenness. We don't know what this ivy was. It could have been 
a general name for an entheogen used in Dionysian ceremonies, or it could have actually been a kind of ivy that just went extinct or was over harvested, or we just don't know. But when I read that, I can't help but think that there's a psychoactive there. On top of which, the Greek word for ivy, kisos, comes from a proto-European, proto-Indo, excuse me, European word, which means a prophetic state of mind. So there's actually a linguistic, a kind of fuzzy linguistic connection to altered states of consciousness with these ancient kinds of ivy. Although highly speculative, Karl Ruck, uh, and you know he's the guy who actually coined the word entheogen, has posited a mushroom might have been used in some of the Dionysian rites among the Satri peoples of Thrace. Uh, Thrace today would be like modern day Bulgaria, Greece, and parts of Turkey. Now the Satri established trade routes across the Aegean Sea, giving them access to all the spices, food, and drugs of the ancient Mediterranean world. Now the reason Karl Ruck hypothesizes that a mushroom might have played a role, and again this is highly speculative, but there was a hydria, which was a Greek water or wine vessel, found in a graveyard that might potentially show a mushroom being mixed into wine. And again, I don't know what this thing is, Karl Ruck believes it to be a mushroom, could be, could be something else. Move now into... Uh, where the story gets a little complicated and we move from the priestess to the witch. This is where history and lore intersect, rec wrestle, and ricochet with each other. At some point, we don't know exactly when, but the entheogens of the priestesses left the temples and started to be used by regular people for magic and witchcraft. The legal structures of the time saw this as criminal. We tend, today tend to think that like pagan Rome, pagan Egypt was just fine with magic and witchcraft and that once the Christians came along they made it all illegal. That is totally historically backwards. Uh, the pagans were actually far more harsh and brutal in meting out punishments to magicians and witch witches than the Christians ever were because the Christians at least gave you the option of converting. The pagans didn't do that, they just executed you. So while totally bigoted, the Christians would give you a way out uh, in a way that pagan Rome never did. Now, we might not know the names of the first psychedelic witches, but we do know the names of how people remembered them. And they should be familiar to many people here. Hecate, Medea, Circe, Hera, Medea. Um, in my historical liberal stance, I believe that, names aside, these women, Hecate, Circe, Medea, were actually based, if even only as a composite, on, okay, thank you, on real women who actually lived. Real women who were priestesses. Now, in my historical conservative stance, even if they weren't real people, I believe they are still important for showing how psycho psychoactives of the entheogenic priestess became the hexing herbs of the psychedelic witch. Let's start with Hecate herself, the goddess of witchcraft. Her name comes from the Greek word hekatos, which means worker from afar. This could be a reference to her spell casting, right? You say the spell over here, the action happens over there. Or it could be a reference to the fact that, while a goddess, she did not live at Olympus with the other goddesses and gods, so she worked her magic from afar, from far away from Olympus. I tend to side with the magical side of it, that it means worker from afar in, a, in the magical sense, but nobody truly knows. Uh, now, moreover, and more importantly for this talk, according to Diodorus of Sicily, Hecate was, and I quote, a keen contriver of many drugs. Hecate was said to have tried and found all of the plants of the earth, discovering, discovering the subtle differences between dose sizes, between poison, medicine, and entheogen. In fact, a manuscript woodcut from 1575 preserves this connection. In that book, again, wherever it is, in the book Psychedelic Mystery Traditions, uh, cool. Uh, there is a picture of Hecate holding both the torch and an opium stalk. Uh, from 1575 that shows that that connection had made its way into uh, the early modern period. Now for this reason, uh, ancient Greeks associated opium with the underworld. 
Hecate's connection with the underworld is relevant here with Crossroads as well, because opium itself in the ancient world was seen as a crossroad between life and death, medicine and poison. Now, the association of Hecate with psychoactives can be seen in mystery ceremonies according to some authors. Take the rites of Artemis Hecate as practiced by the witch Medea, and I say witch Medea because the actual Greek term is polypharmakon, which actually means knowledgeable in many drugs or drug savvy, right? Poly, many, pharmakon, we got our word pharmacy from that. Now, the plants in her garden were said to have included mandrake, aconite, and opium, powerful psychoactive ingredients that would turn up centuries later in witches' flying ointments, which I'll be discussing tomorrow. For now, they were said to be used in her worship ceremonies. So let's get a little deep and get inside the rites of uh, Artemis Hecate. What did the ceremony actually look like? How were the psychoactives used? If we can believe the anonymous author of the Argonautica Orphica, written around the 5th to 6th centuries of Common Era, they went something like this. The initiate would don a black robe, then fashion two small figurines out of barley meal. And then, this is a little sad, but it's the reality of the situation. They would then sacrifice three black dogs. Sacrificing animals for magic and mystery purposes in the ancient world was all the rage. People did it all the time. So, you know, people today say, honor the ancestors? Mm, not always. Don't always. We're a lot wiser than they were in many respects. And a lot more compassionate. Anyway, the dog's blood would be drained, mixed with copper, sulfite, bronze, plant, and other herbs. This concoction would be stuffed into the bellies of the fortified canines, and their carcasses would be thrown onto a fire along with the psychoactive herbs. You were supposed to inhale these herbs and get visions of uh, Hecate uh, and uh, Paramedia. And if they were said to dance around the fire, you would be welcomed into the society. Now, we don't know if this person that wrote this, again, the author is anonymous, was giving us clues as to what actually went on, or if she was just pulling this from her own imagination. But the fact that they have the sacrifice of dogs embedded in this, which we know, that's one of the few things we know happened during um, magical rituals to Hecate, leads me to believe that there might be something to this. Now, we don't know if Medea was real, but we do know about a real priestess of the Mysteries of Hecate named Chrysemi. That's actually also the name of my cat. This is where her name comes from. Chrysemi was the general of the armies of King Nopus. King Nopus, uh, this was back in the day when all of uh, Greece was just a bunch of warring city-states. And this guy wanted to unite all of them, so he went to an oracle and he said, how can I win and unite all of Greece? And the oracle said, well, you better put a woman in charge of your armies or you're going to fail. Nopus was a smart man, and so he did. He put Chrysemi. He went to the temples of Ikate in Thessaly, found the priestess, and said, I'll take this one. Boom, made her the general. Chrysemi ended up being a rather brilliant general. She had a decisive victory against the Ionians who were hauled up in the city of Eritrea. Here's what she did. She ordered a bull to be brought to her. She then fed a bull some kind of psychoactive substance. We don't know what it was. I hypothesize that it was the Amanita muscaria, and I'll get into why that is in a moment. But what happened was, Chrysemi takes this uh, bull, feeds it the psychoactive, and leaves it for about an hour in a pen. When the psychoactive starts to have effect on the bull, she orders an altar be brought out to the battlefield, and the bull to be slaughtered on the psalter. Now, people are still fighting now. Because in the ancient world, this is often overlooked sometimes, but you could kill kings, happened all the time. You could kill queens, it happened all the time. Holy shit, you could not kill a priestess. They were by and large, unless they were condemned by the law for execution, which did happen as well, but on the battlefield, people in the same way, um, you know, you have the, uh, the monks and in medieval times they'd be pulling the, the, the wounded off the battlefield and it, tending to them. And both sides generally agreed, yeah, you, you leave the monks alone, you know, you don't really to Priestesses kind of had that same privilege. 
So, Crescemi, just not giving a shit about arrows flying, sword shields, just walks right out to the battlefield, has this bull brought out with her, goes as if she's going to sacrifice it, but then cuts the ropes to let it run free to the other side. And so the enemy catches this bull. And they said, ah, oh, you stupid Athenians, look what happened when you put a woman in charge of your armies. And so they sacrificed the bull and they ate it. But that's exactly what Crisemi wanted them to do. And here's why I think she fed that bull the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Because we know today in Siberia, people will often wait for reindeer to eat the Amanita muscaria and take a pee and they will drink that urine to get the effects of the mushroom. They will also sometimes slaughter the reindeer, eat its meat to get those effects. So what do you think happened when Crescemi's enemies ate that bull that they sacrificed? They all started tripping balls. And Crescemi watched and when she saw that they were clearly losing their minds, she ordered her troops in to slaughter them all. That's how Greece was united. With a uh, little bit of time I have left, does anybody want to hear real quick what a magic spell in the ancient world that involves a lot of opium looked like? Yeah. Yeah? Cool. Okay, well, excellent. <laughs> so, the Greek magical papyri features a complex, complex love spell called the Sword of Dardanos that incorporates both ancient Grecian and Jewish magic a long prayer to Aphrodite and was designed specifically for a male magician because sometimes they did draw lines. And I could, I could also show you a spell that was specifically for women. But again, this is getting into magic, not mystery rites, so they're different things. Now this one, like I said, you have to ingest a lot of opium to do this spell right. The formula instructs the magician to find a magnetic stone and carve a scene of Aphrodite sitting on top of Psyche. Um, He's supposed to scroll some words that I don't know what Akmaj Ra Papesi actually means, but he has to scroll that on there. He should then place the stone in his mouth and say, I call upon you, author of creation, turn the soul of her, and he says her name, to me, and he says his name, so that she may love me, so that she may have passion for me, so that she may give me what's in her power. Let her say to me what is in her soul, because I have called upon your great name. A gold leaf should then be inscribed with the angelic names of the Hebrew mystery traditions. Thoriel, Michael, Gabriel, Oriel, Messiah, Iriel, and Israel. The leaves are then fed to a partridge which should be killed and worn around the neck. So you're literally wearing a dead bird around your neck. Anybody here into mid-90s Norwegian black metal? They would have ate that kind of shit up. Salut. They actually, one of them used to literally put a dead bird in a sandwich bag and breathe it in before going on stage so that he would have the stench of death on his breath as he sang. <laughs> Good times. Anyway, uh, the magician is now ready to ingest the pythiogenic potion. Remember, pythiogen is using psychedelics and magic. Through burning pharmacon as incense and drinking a magical concoction, composed of the same ingredients as the incense. Those ingredients were manna, whatever that is, four drams of storax, opium, frankincense, and half a dram of dried fig. Just need to say really quick, I didn't say gram, I said a dram. A dram is roughly equivalent to 3.30 of our grams. So this person is taking almost 13 fucking grams of opium in this spell. That is a lot. That is so much goddamn opium. Now he has transformed, at least psychologically, into the likeness of the god or daemon who the object of his affection worships. It was supposed to kind of, so if he worships Dionysus, it kind of gives him that Dionysus swagger. If he worships Apollo, it kind of gives him that Apollo, you know, poetic musical kind of thing. He is then supposed to go to the woman's house, I imagine stumbling incoherently through the streets because he's on almost 14 fucking grams of opium, say a prayer to her, somehow go back to his house, light more opium incense, and set a table for his expected guest. This was said to make the woman come and appear before him.
<laughs> Sir, uh, with mushrooms, yes. And not going to the woman's house, because that's creepy. I just eat mushrooms when I'm trying to say, hey, what's up, brother? Hey, question. Yeah. I was curious if... What? I feel like I come off of That is a great question. So, are the different substances associated with certain goddesses or gods? Um, when you go that far back into the ancient world, everything is hazy. But again, uh, I had those uh, handouts I passed around. Opium does seem to have very much been associated with the great mother goddess. In Greece, she would eventually be called um, Persephone and Demeter. She would split into the mother, mother, mother. My Italian is coming outside. The mother goddess. The mother goddess. Um, that's something else if I can wrap up real quick. Uh, the rites of Eleusis. People talk about how they used ergot. Have any of you heard about that? Okay, there is literally no evidence at all that people were using ergot at all, there is plenty of evidence that they were using opium. <laughs> plenty. None for ergot. What it is is, we today, because we all like LSD, right, and we're going through an opioid crisis, so we like LSD, don't like opium, so what we tend to do is throw our modern ideas onto the past. That's called an anachronism, when you throw a modern idea onto the past. Now, sometimes anachronisms are easy to spot. Like if I were to say that on uh, Abraham Lincoln's way to deliver the Gettysburg Address, he stopped at Taco Bell. You'd all say, wait a minute, there was no Taco Bell back then. That's an anachronism. Same thing with the ancient world. We like LSD, so we try to throw LSD down the throats of the ancient Grecians, but there's no evidence for that. And yes, I've read every single book on the topic, and none of them present any evidence, because everyone always says, oh, did you read this? Yes. Yes, I have. And no, they did not have any evidence. So one area that I might get into tomorrow where ergot was pretty popular was in Finnmark, Norway. It seems that certain women would use ergot for its LSD-like effects to teach the secrets of witchcraft to other women. So they would give them an ergot drink and in the DAS, in the, uh, the reports, a guy named uh, Hans Lillenskold wrote the, um, the reports about these women doing this and he said, oh yeah, they would throw the little black pellets from the grains, meaning ergot, into milk or water to teach other women the secrets of witchcraft. So people, there is something to say about ergot and its use for its psychoactive and psychedelic effects. There's just no evidence that this was going on at Eleusis. Oh, did someone else have... No, I, I just got it so sorry. Okay. Also, uh, because my time is almost up, I am so psyched to talk about this stuff beyond like this Q&A, so if anyone's like, holy shit, let's talk about psychedelics and magic and witchcraft, I would love to do that with you. So, uh, I think that's probably my time. I think I'm probably over time. Um, I have, and I'm supposed to say this, but I do have some books for sale if anyone's interested. Uh, not too many of them. One of them is that book, Psychedelic Mystery Traditions. Uh, the other one is about my own magical practices with psychedelics that I'll be going over on my talk on Sunday. Uh, I hope to see you there. It's going to get really weird. Oh, cool. Here's a tar tarot. Here. Okay.